Good morning. If you'll stand and turn in your hymnals to 370, Rejoice the Lord is King. pray together. Father, we come before you this morning, and our hearts do rejoice. They rejoice in your grace and your mercy. They rejoice in your greatness and your splendor. They rejoice in your character, O oh God, because when we are near you, when we come into your house, we can feel your presence, and we know how much you love us, how much you care for us. So as we gathered here this day to worship you, Allow us to do so in truth and spirit, Father. Cleanse us in such a way that we can have pure worship here this day. Not merely in the singing, but in the hearing of your word and the fellowship with one another. Just allow us to worship you purely and make us more and more and more like Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. Now if you'll turn to 377, Alleluia, sing to Jesus.
remain standing. If you would, please take your bulletin and open to the inside cover. We will affirm our faith together in unison. This Easter affirmation of faith says, We believe in Jesus Christ the Lord, who died on the cross to free us from sin, who rose from the dead to give us life and hope. We believe in God his Father, who raised Jesus from the dead, who desires that all people everywhere be saved. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who moves us to both faith and obedience, who is the guarantee of our salvation. We believe God has made us his people to invite others to follow the risen Jesus, to proclaim forgiveness of sins and hope, to the praise of his glory. This we believe. You may be seated. Father, we come before you again this morning, still thankful and grateful for being gathered in your house with these, your people, to worship you and to praise your name, to recall your great and mighty deeds. And Father, as we think about your character, we are always reminded of your holiness, of your righteousness, of your perfection. Your perfection reminds us also, Father, that we are not perfect, that we indeed are often not holy nor righteous, that sin abides in our lives. Father, we wish it were not so. We, We try and we struggle, but still, sin sometimes prevails. We yield the temptation. We give in to the desires of our heart instead of the desires of your will. So, Lord, I ask you to forgive us of these sins, to cleanse us from whatever they are, and to make us holy and righteous here in your house this morning, a vessel worthy of you to pour yourself into through the power of the Holy Spirit. We seek that this morning, Father, as long as, as well as we seek the power over sin. We seek the victory in Jesus that can be ours. Lord, we sin more than we want, and we ask that you, you help us overcome temptation, that you help us to live a life that's pleasing to you, that brings glory and honor to your name, that helps us be more and more and more like Jesus. And then, Lord, as we become more like him, we, we begin to understand that our prayers are not merely reciting uh, a, a list of things we want, Things we may even need. Things that may even make us desperate. Those things are still part of who we are. But we come first to praise you. And then we come, Father, to lift up others. Those on our hearts and minds. Those on our prayer lists that are suffering this very day. Whether that suffering be physical due to illness or injury. Whether that suffering be relational or emotional or mental spiritual, whatever the suffering may be, Father, your word promises us that your grace is sufficient. And we ask for that sufficient grace to flood the lives of those on whom we lift up in prayer this very morning. And Father, that includes ourselves, for we are in need of healing and hope. We're in need of forgiveness and mercy. We are in need of all that we ask for others. And we're going to trust you to reach out and touch us. Then, Father, we want to thank you for those who who have been on our prayer list that are on the way to to wellness, that are recovering, that have had surgeries and have done wonderful. We praise you that you were there and you met those needs. And may we see more and more needs met in the power of your name. Now, if you would, please join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our invitation to give generously this morning comes in 1 John chapter 3, where the apostle writes, How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Let us now honor God through our giving. Let us pray together. Father, we come before you yet again, ever thankful for every good and perfect gift that you pour into our lives. You are always generous. You are always faithful. And we praise you for that. We ask, Lord, that as we come to the time in the service where we return a small portion of that which you've given to us, we ask you to use it and bless it and multiply it so that there is enough to do all that you're calling us to do. Not just what you have called us to do, but what you are calling us to do in the future. Father, our, our returning of these gifts is our way of saying that we love you. It's one way that we say that thank you. And it's the way we always say we trust you to continue to provide for our needs. So bless those who trust you. Bless those who faithfully give. This whole congregation, Father faithfully gives week after week after week. We love you and we thank you in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated and as you do so, Steve is working his way down for the children's message so our children can come forward. How are you guys? Good. Yeah. So, question for you. Hi. Hi. What is, what is this thing? A microphone. A microphone. And what does a microphone do? Um, tell a thing. You, 
you sing into it. What does a microphone do, Jimmy, you know? Um, you talk in it. And you talk into it, and what does it do when you talk into it? Um, you tell people what it does. Yeah. Well, what happens if I turn this off? So, did you know that God wants you to be a microphone? Did you know that? God wants you to be a microphone. No. Yeah, let me read you a word. This is what Jesus said. He said, don't worry about what you're going to speak because your father will speak through you. And he said that he's going to use us to tell people about himself. So, if... if Emily up there, if you don't tell her about Jesus, who's ever going to hear? How's she ever going to hear? Or your daddy back there, or somebody you don't somebody you know at school that they don't know Jesus. You can be the microphone for Jesus, right? Did you know that's what Pastor Mike does? Right? He stands up every week and he reads to us. What does he read to us from? Yeah, from God, from the Bible, doesn't he? Yeah. And he's being God's microphone. That's the way God talks to us. So you can be a microphone too. You can talk to anybody that doesn't know Jesus and even people that do know Jesus and remind them about Jesus. How's that? And remember, you've got to use your mouth because if it's turned off like the microphone, they can't hear you, right? Yeah. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you that you depend on us to be your mouth so that others can hear about us. Help us to be bold and brave, not to be afraid to tell people about Jesus and your great love for us. All this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Now if you'll stand and take your hymnals and turn to 342, Rock of Ages. When it comes to winning a ball game, running a business, raising a family, growing a church, or building a wall, teamwork is essential for sustained success to occur.
Teamwork is not optional, it is essential. Famed automobile executive Leah Coca once asked legendary football coach Vince Lombardi what it took to have a winning team. In his autobiography, Iacocca records Lombardi's answer. Lombardi said, there are a lot of coaches with good ball clubs who know the fundamentals and have plenty of discipline, but still don't win the game. Then you come to the third ingredient. If you're going to play together as a team, you've got to care for one another. Now, this is a man talking about grown men, some of them 300 pounds. Masculine men that can't spell love, much less say they love you. You've got to care for one another. You've got to love one another, Lombardi says. Each player has to be thinking about the next guy and saying to himself, if you don't block that man, Paul's going to get his legs broken. I have to do my job well in order that he can do his. The difference between mediocrity and greatness is the feeling these guys have for each other. Now ponder that for a moment. The difference between mediocrity, just average, just getting by, winning some games and losing others. The difference between mediocrity and greatness is the feeling these guys have for each other. With all that said, I want to ask you to please rise and body your spirit in honor of God's word. It's recorded in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. The prophet right, writes, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burns? Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, so that they may no longer suffer disgrace. I told them that the hand of my God had been gracious upon me, and also the words that the king had spoken to me. Then they said, let us start building. So they committed themselves to the common good. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Lord, we have heard your word. We have sung your praises. We have enjoyed fellowship with one another. Now we ask that you speak to us and speak to us clearly so that we see the truth in your word that you have for us this very day. In your holy name I do pray. Amen. You may be seated. After King Solomon's death, Israel split into a northern kingdom which retained the name Israel and a southern kingdom called Judah named after the largest tribe there, Judah. Some 200 years later, the kingdom of Israel was defeated by the Assyrians and then sometime later the kingdom of Judah was overrun by the Babylonians and the Jewish people were in exile. At least the people of Means were in exile while the peasants remained in Judah. They presented no, no danger to the new kingdom. Their peasants are uneducated. They don't have the resources to start a rebellion. You only move out those who are a danger. So you have the elite, the people of Means in exile. Now with the rise of a new Persian ruler, Babylon was defeated and the exiled Jews who chose to return to Judah were allowed to do so. All did not choose to return. Everybody didn't desire to go back to the homeland. But those who were allowed, those who chose to, were allowed to. During this period, the prophet Nehemiah, a Jewish exile who held a high position in the Persian court as the king's cupbearer, Nehemiah learned of the deplorable conditioned condition of the, the beloved city, Jerusalem. The wall of the city had been broken down and the gates had been burned, leaving the residents of Jerusalem in deep distress. Upon hearing this, Nehemiah mourned for several days, fasting and praying. His prayer, which is recorded in the chapter 1 of the book of Nehemiah, is one of the most moving prayers recorded in the Old Testament. I would suggest that you take a moment this afternoon and read chapter 1 
it should touch your heart. Now after his prayer, the Persian king appointed Nehemiah as the governor of Judea. Now he's in a position of government back in, in uh, Babylon, or now under the rule of Cyrus the Great, but he appoints him governor of Judea. That is, he sent him back home with power and authority. In fact, he authorized him to take charge of rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. Joanna told me following the choir warming up this morning that she heard a preacher on the radio the other day preaching about this and said, we're going to build a wall and you're going to pay for it. Uh, but the truth of the story is the king of Syria and the enemy king paid for the building of this wall. Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem and he proved to be a dynamic leader with the gift for organizing and directing the cooperative efforts of his people. Once in Jerusalem, Nehemiah surveyed the damage of the city's wall. Then he gave his assessment to the local leaders, the ones who had been in charge before he returned home. Nehemiah pointed out that pointed out the damage that Israel's enemies had done to the wall over the years, as well as the damage caused by the neglect of the local leadership. Now let's stop and imagine our spiritual lives just for a few moments. You can be damaged by your spiritual enemies. They will attack you. Satan is seeking to devour you. But you can neglect your own spiritual wall. And neglected walls will crumble. Think of any abandoned house you know. It may not be vandalized, but it begins to decay the moment someone moves out, and eventually it will fall. So Nehemiah tells the folks that yes, the enemies have done a lot of damage to the to the wall, but your lack of care and concern for it has damaged it as well. And the second part of his assessment was not very well received. Nonetheless, most agreed that there was an acute need for a protective wall around the city. Every nation seems to realize that they need a strong defense. Nehemiah then made an urgent appeal for workers to, to begin restoring the wall immediately. immediately. This is not some project we want to put on the back burner. This is something that needs done now. Nehemiah's appeal was very effective, and soon many people joined forces in this most necessary community project. For years, the people had deemed rebuilding the wall to be too massive a project for them to accomplish. But under Nehemiah's leadership, they learned the value of teamwork in undertaking the quote-unquote impossible dream. The value of teamwork, that is, they learned how much they could accomplish by working together. A simple lesson, but one we often forget. The restoration of the wall initially progressed well, but in time some of the people became discouraged by the continual need to remove rubble from the work site. Back in the year 2000, I went on a work trip to Armenia, Colombia, following the devastating earthquake there that destroyed much of that city. And our mission team went to rebuild houses. But instead, we spent most of our time cleaning up debris from the earthquake. Carpenters went to drive nails, but used shovels instead. Electricians went to wire homes, but pushed wheelbarrows instead. And by the way, a man who was a member of the church here at the time, no longer here, I think now lives in Arizona, but he dropped a loaded wheelbarrow on my head. That may explain a lot, I'm not sure. But they went to do one thing and were tasked to do another. Clean up consumed the project. The point is that everyone did their assigned task. But none of us were thrilled about doing so. I don't like shovels. Matt, I'm pretty sure I'm allergic to them. We did our assigned tasks, though we were not thrilled to do so. The same was true of the workers in Jerusalem back in Nehemiah's day. 
They were further disheartened of the threats from those who opposed rebuilding the city wall. You know, somebody is always opposed to progress. No matter how many think it's a good idea, there's always a few that do not. Nonetheless, under Nehemiah's direction, the people strengthened both their resolve and their defenses. Whenever they were open to attack, they, they stationed armed guards. From then until the completion of the wall, half the people worked construction and half were on guard duty. And in addition, every worker had his weapon nearby for protection. Every worker. Yes, you have a session in staff that prays over you. But you need to keep prayer close in your life. It's for your own protection. The people's teamwork and cooperation eventually paid off in a big way as the restoration of the wall was completed and everyone in the city, including the scoffers, those who did not want it to happen, everyone in the city enjoyed its benefits. The wall protected all, no matter how you voted in the town meeting. Now as I think about the story of Nehemiah, and man, it is, it's a rich story. It is full of all sorts of stuff. I could probably stay in Nehemiah for two months and never preach it all out. But as I, I'm not, I'm not planning on doing that unless the Lord speaks to me sometime between now and next Sunday, but as I think about the story of Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem, it reminds me that if we're going to accomplish the mission and ministry that God intends for this congregation, we must cooperate with one another as valuable teammates. Don't let that word valuable slip away. That's a wonderful objective. We must cooperate with one another as valuable teammates. Much needed teammates. No one is expendable. Valuable teammates. Executives in business and industry tell us that most people who lose their jobs are not let go because they cannot do their job but because of a failure to get along with their co-workers. That is, they did not value their teammates. Now let me interrupt here to say that, that I've been told that the best time to preach about a particular problem is when that problem does not exist in the congregation. So let me be clear. To my knowledge, and I have very limited knowledge sometimes, but to my knowledge, we do not have any staff, or elders on our session, or church members who do not generally get along very well with each other. So I'm not preaching against a problem going on. An occasional disagreement, certainly, but no lasting rifts. Nonetheless, we need to always be on guard, keep our weapons near us. We need to always be on guard to fix a minor problem as soon as it arises so that it does not grow into a major problem. If you ever notice problems have a way of growing? We always need to be on guard to fix a minor problem as soon as it arises so it does not grow into a major problem. And we need to vow. We need to vow to cooperate with our teammates even more than we have in the past. Now again, I'm not aware of a problem. This is preventative medicine, not corrective discipline. But we need to vow to cooperate with our team mo teammates even more than we have in the past. Now sometimes distinguishing who is privileged to perform which task is challenging. Almost everyone wants to be the quarterback. But someone is needed to play all the 22 plus positions on the football team. Perhaps you've heard about the newspaper editor who had just been informed that a severe storm here in town had caused a high voltage line to fall across a downtown street. The editor assigned two reporters to cover the story. He sent them from his office with these words. No one knows whether the wire is live or not. So I want you two to cooperate. One of you touch the wire and the other one write the story. 
Cooperation does not mean that the same person always does the most dangerous or hardest work. Then all the dirty jobs shouldn't fall to one person. And everyone, someone else in the church shouldn't get all the glory parts. Instead, tasks within the church are meant to be shared based on our God-given <laughs> gifts and abilities. Shared based on our God-given gifts and abilities. And every single one of us have at least one God-given gift and no telling how many abilities and we need to be using them for the good of all. God intends us, intends for us to use the gifts and abilities he's given us. <clears throat> now, you are blessed to have Rebecca Prinshaw fill the pulpit in my absence. She is a gifted preacher. And this is not going to be a news flash, but nonetheless, I should not play the piano in her absence because that is outside of my gifting. You know what happens when we work outside of our gifting? We become dissatisfied very quickly and easily and burn out. We're doing things we're not supposed to do and we get burned out. But when we're doing those things that God has created us to do, when we're working in the gifts and abilities he's gave us, nothing satisfies us other than doing what he's created us to be. And he desires all of us to be busy in his house. Now, one of the reasons we have a rotating session is so, so that no single group of elders has to carry the heavy responsibilities of leadership continually. It's all about sharing responsibility and all working together. When I think about cooperation with others, several things come to mind. First, life reaches a level of worth and value when we give something of ourselves to other people. Now that's something I believe I would write down if I was taking notes. Life reaches a level of worth and value when we give something of ourselves to other people. People consumed with self are the most unhappy, miserable people I know. You can think of a few of those in your life. People consumed with self are unhappy and miserable. I once read about two ladies who were accomplished pianists. After each of these women had a stroke, they met each other in a rehabilitation center, sort of like Patricia Neal here in town. After months of therapy, they began regaining some movement in their limbs, though one lady was partially paralyzed on her right side and the other on her left. And one day while chatting with each other in the day room there at the rehab center, they both sat down, they, they learned of their mutual love of the piano, then they both sat down at the center's piano. One lady's fingers moved back and forth on the left side of the keyboard, the other lady's fingers carried the melody on the right side. Partners in teamwork, doing together what neither of them could do alone. Now don't miss that. Doing together what neither of them can do alone. And I can only imagine the joy and these two stroke victims' faces when they begin to cooperate and play the piano. Doing together what neither of them could do alone. Again, life reaches a level of worth and value when we give something to other people. Notice that gift didn't cost a penny. There's a second thing to consider. That is, when we cooperate with one another, our combined effort is often far greater than our individual labors. That is, two can do more than one. Three can do more than two. Four can do more 
and five. Our first pastorate was in rural West Tennessee, and I stress the word rural. <clears throat> One year at the Gibson County Fair, I was among the spectators <clears throat> gathered for an old-fashioned horse pool. Now, when I was growing up, <clears throat> when I was growing up, Cedar Bluff was still the country, and an occasional tractor pull was not an unusual event, but I had never seen a horse pull, so this captivated my attention, and I, I went to this horse pull, and the grand champion that night pulled a sled with 4,500 pounds on it. I was impressed. The runner-up was close with 4,400 pounds on its sled. Now the horse's owners knew each other, neighboring farmers knew each other, and they began to wonder what the two horses could pull if they were hitched together. Separately, they had pulled nearly 9,000 pounds, but when teamed together, they pulled a little more than 12,000 pounds. Imagine. Imagine the powerful force that we could exert as a congregation if we all, and not just some, but if we all pull together and truly practice teamwork. I'm beyond thankful that none of us appear to be pulling in opposite directions. But I cannot help but wonder what it would look like if we all pulled in the same direction at the same time. The third thing is important as well. And that is cooperation gives us a sense of well-being that is impossible to achieve when we are only concerned with ourselves. I said it a moment ago, the one that's only concerned with the self is most miserable. Cooperation will create joy and peace and satisfaction in our lives. Back in the 1940s, just after the close of World War II, Jimmy Durante received a telephone call from Ed Sullivan. And for you younger folks, uh, these two men were among the most famous performers in show business in their day. Sullivan asked Durante to go with him to a hospital to entertain wounded and disabled vets. Durante tried to beg off since he had a couple of radio shows scheduled to do that afternoon. Sullivan promised that they would be back in time to do the radio shows. The two then drove out to the hospital and Durante did his act. What happened next surprised Durante, who was standing off, surprised Sullivan, I should say, who was standing off to the side. Upon hearing the applause, Durante proceeded to perform two more of his routines. When he left the stage to a standing ovation, Sullivan said to him, Jimmy, you are just great. But now you'll probably be late, late to your radio shows. Maybe even this then. Durante motioned him over and replied, look at the front row. And you'll see why I forgot all about the radio shows. Sullivan then peeked through the curtain and saw two soldiers in the center of the front row. Each had lost an arm in the war, but they were applauding by clapping their two remaining hands. The church as a whole, and this congregation in particular, is in continual need, continual need, of the cooperation of those willing to expend a little extra effort a little extra time, a little extra money, to be creative in accomplishing our missions and ministries. The ancient Israelites in rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem learned the necessity of working together as teammates. We too should recognize the obligation of cooperating for the good of all obligation of cooperating. In the words of Vince Lombardi, if we're going to play together as a team, you've got to care.
for one another. You've got to love one another. Now I am thankful that to the best of my knowledge is true here. We love and care for each other. And it shows up when somebody's in a need. But it needs to show up every day as we attempt to build the kingdom of God through this, through this congregation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24, the Apostle Paul wrote, Let no one seek only his own good, but also that of the other person. What can that mean but that we are to live our lives for others in light of the example that Jesus Christ has given us? We are to live our lives for others. Catch this. It's not about you. Your life is not about you. My life is not about me. But my life is about glorifying God and I do that when I cooperate with others for the good of his church and his kingdom. So if that is what we ought to do, then let us do it. Let us pray together. Lord, come before you again this morning. Thankful for your word and thankful that you work with us and through us. And I, I'm just so grateful for this congregation. I see them love each other. Now as we love each other, put us to work. Work is more than just showing up on Sunday morning. Put us to work. Bring us together for Sunday school and for Bible studies. Let us be microphones, as Steve shared earlier with the children. Put us to work on the wall of our lives. On the wall of this congregation. On the wall of the kingdom. In your holy name. Amen. If you'll stand and take your hymnals and turn to 344, Grace Greater Than Our Sin.
of weeks ago, I said that you will never receive a better invitation as long as you live than to come to Jesus and find rest. I'm here today to say you'll never hear a more profound, life-changing statement than what we just sang. God's grace is greater than our sin. Thank you for being here. I pray that God has blessed you in some way. I know he did me during the closing song, but I pray he blessed you in some way. Let us receive now this benediction. Believe in the risen Jesus. And live accordingly by working with others to build up the kingdom of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.